everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Happiness Matters, the show where our guests inspire you, encourage you with their stories. And uh, it's really to give you hope and let you know you're not alone. I'm here. I'm your host, Beanie Man, with my awesome co-host, Mo the Service Dog. And today, I'm excited. I'm so happy. Today, is my, I have a guest here. And this is actually the first time he and I met face to face. He is, uh, what are you, like a psychic reader, psychic medium? Yeah, clairvoyant reader, healer, and teacher. That's okay. Cool. And that's cool. how we connected because I wanted a reading and a friend of mine connected us and <sighs> that's all I can say. I had like what, two or three readings with you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so my guest is Dave Clark. Hi, Dave. I'm so Hello. excited to have you here today. Thank, thank you for you being for here. Me. Yeah. Thank you too for having me. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to have you. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, who you are, what you do, and um, yeah, we take it from there. Yeah, sure. So my name's, name's Dave Clark. I'm a clairvoyant reader, healer, and teacher. Um, I wasn't, uh, you know, born this way. <laughs> um, I started out and I have a degree in chemistry, and then I got into special education uh, early on, teaching kids with autism. And then I had a daughter who was severely disabled, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, she got me, uh, basically, I've been in special ed. So I have a master's in early childhood special ed. Um, but over the period of time with my daughter and my life, it's led me into this this frame of work, which is giving clairvoyant readings and healings and uh, teaching classes. So to help people discover more of themselves as spirit, to let go of the limits and programmings and pictures that uh, divide them from themselves so that they can be more whole with spirit and identify with their truth and their authentic voice. I love that. And Dave actually submitted uh, his story with his daughter for our book series. And yes, you can submit your story. Yes, yes, yes. Go to mattersofperspective.com. You'll find the book guidelines. Love to hear your story and include it in the book. But anyway, so you shared that story and it so touched my heart. And I did not know that when we first met, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I had my readings, because, hey, my readings were all about me, myself and I. I'm not going <laughs> to lie about this. <laughs> really easy, <all> right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um but I just, I just so love, and I took one of your classes as well um, to, to dabble into the, you know, my gifts that are still pretty much dormant because they just are. <laughs> I haven't uh, set the alarm yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I love your story with Ella, and we're going to talk about that right after this commercial break. Welcome back. I'm here with my guest, Dave Clark. And of course, you know, my awesome co-host who is sleeping right now, Mo the Service Dog. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about your, uh, about your Ella. Yeah. There's the story. And because I, the reason I want to share this with our audience is you're not alone. You're not alone. And your story, I believe, can help so many other people. So, and that's why I really do the show. It's that simple. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about Ella. Yeah, well, Ella, she completely changed my life because prior to that, you know, I grew up in a, a family in, a, in addiction and violence and lots of different things. And luckily I had basketball that kind of helped me stay out of any like serious trouble. Oh, when good. I was, like, grew, <laughs> yeah, I know. I grew up right outside of Baltimore City. But um, when, when Ella was born, um, you know, we, we, my wife and I, we were 30 and it was, um, we, it was our first child. So we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, we were just really excited to have this kid, you know, and my wife's pregnancy was, everything went really well, was smooth. And, um, we had decided to do a, um, uh, have Ella born at a birthing center. Nice. So we were excited, excited for that too. We thought that would be the best, best path to welcome in this new soul, you know, and, um, so uh, my wife went into labor and like Saturday Night Live was on at the time. I remember it was a Saturday night. We we're watching it. And, and then next morning we go to the to the birthing center and um, and then my wife, go, we were going through the whole process. And uh, it was a really long uh, labor. And um, but, you know, we didn't know. Uh, we just thought it was normal. Everything was normal at the time. And finally, Ella decided to come out, but she wasn't breathing. And, and they put her on my my wife's chest and. I'm always like, no, 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 something's wrong, something's wrong. And, 
And, um, and they're like, no, no, just pat her. And, and then things really started to go south after that. Oh, wow. To the point where, you know, she, she wasn't breathing for an extended period of time. And uh, to the point where at the time I was holding her head and I thought, man, they have to stop. It's been too long. And the minute I said that, boom, she pinks up. <laughs> like her skin started to get pink. And I was like, wow, okay, great. Um, but then, you know, we magic. rushed to the hospital. Yeah, it was, it was really much, very much like magic. And, um, you know, we go to the hospital and we spend three weeks in the NICU. And um, so she ended up having, um, you know, because of lack of oxygen at birth, she ended up, uh, her technical diagnosis was spastic quadriplegic um, cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy, spastic quadriplegic. But she had, she had a lot of other concomitant issues because of the brain injury. So, um, so she never, for her whole life, she didn't walk or talk. And, um, but she was a miraculous kid. I mean, she was an amazing child. Um, but early on, uh, my wife and I realized that um, because of all of her needs and, you know, when she first came home, she was on an NG tube, which is a feeding tube that goes through your nose. And, um, and there was a lot of challenging things in terms of the pumps and stuff like that. So I ended up um, quitting my job and, and uh, moving and, and being a stay-at-home dad to take care of her. And, um, so eventually we ended up um, moving out and moving into a place with my mom's and um, going, making it to Vermont. I thought, oh, I'll help kids like Ella who with these, cause we were trying every therapy under the sun to try and fix her. You know, we thought, oh, we'll do this. My wife would do all the research and then I do all the therapy. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, my wife would do some of it too. In the beginning, she did a lot. Um, so we kind of shared it, but then it, it came to a point where she was doing the research and I was doing a lot of the therapy. And so I got accepted to physical therapy school here in Vermont at University of Vermont. And I thought oh, that'd be a great way to help out kids like Ella. Um, but it ended up being, it's like med school. So it was too much. Ella needed more care. Um, so I ended up just being a stay-at-home dad and I took her to school as her paraeducator. But you and, know, it's so awesome that you were able to do that. Uh -huh. You know, because I know there, there's so many parents out there with special needs children who don't have that luxury. Absolutely. And it, it would, the only reason we were able to do that is because of how the birth process was. And we ended up, um, Ella ended up winning a suit, which ends up going into a trust for her. So oh, wow. it, helped, it helped to afford me to be able to stay at home. It, we couldn't, um, those kinds of trusts are re very regulated. So you can't just like take all the money and run. It's not, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> right. Um, you have to, you have to. That's petition. a good thing. It is, it is. So you, the parents don't waste it. So right. um, you have to petition a judge each time. In Maryland, you had to petition a judge each time to withdraw any money. So we had a little stipend that allowed me to be able to stay uh, at home. And I mean, we made way, way, made way more money, but it was enough. But and before Ella was born, we made, made way more money. But then uh, the money we got from them was enough for me to be able to stay home and take her to school. Nice. Uh, especially in uh, here in Vermont, the special education services were so much better <laughs> than in, <laughs> in Maryland. It was phenomenal. So they allowed me as the dad to take her to school, which is very unusual to have a parent taking your child to school. Wow. But it was really fun. Ella was just an amazing kid. And um, I got to learn a lot about the kids always knew uh, what Ella wanted. They're, oh, she's so beautiful. She's so pretty. You know, how, how, how did she get to be like that? You know, they're very curious. But I learned early on that the adults are the ones that needed the coaching. They were the ones that needed to, um, they, they, hey, it's okay if they look at Ella, because then that invites an opportunity for conversation and discussion. But a lot of the parents and adults, oh, don't stare. You know, don't don't look at, and I'd be like, oh no, you can look, stare, talk, ask any questions you want, because I always knew that I didn't want people to be afraid of Ella, but to be able to approach her to build relationships. So I love that. Um, yeah, so it was really just beautiful, and she was very very healthy uh, most of her life. Um, and then, um, and and one of the things we struggled most with with Ella was developing a, a form of communication that she could use with her kids and people who didn't know her. Mm. And uh, we really struggled with that. We tried all kinds of stuff, went from low tech to high tech to, and eventually we just settled on doing a yes and a no. That was it. Whatever, wherever she looked, yes, no. But it's kind of limiting because you have to ask the right question, right? Um, but you know, in, in a sense, yes, it's limiting, but it's also helping you develop that gift to ask the right questions. That's right. And not, not just in, in Ella's situation, but for life in general, because of because you've trained that muscle, mm -hmm. you know, now when you ask questions, I guarantee you they're way different mm -hmm. from, say, I would ask questions because right. 
you know, you have that, that skill behind you now. And yeah, I just fumble through it. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, no. You know, it's, um, it was very interesting because I, I, like, here's one of the, we've been trying for trying to get this communication device. And then one day we had an assembly and used at the assembly at the school is about 400 people. We all had to get down to the gym and we either Ella and I would go first and beat the traffic or we go last and end up, you know, beat the traffic that way. So the traffic would already go. So we decided to go last and I took, and I was wheeling Ella. Ella used to lay on a bed mm. and she would lay on her belly because she had really bad scoliosis. So she couldn't sit. Oh. And um, so I'm wheeling her in and I wheel her into the gymnasium and 400 heads turned and looked right at Ella. And I thought, man, I cannot command that kind of attention. You know, I'm like the minute Ella walks into any oh, I have chills. Room, wow. <laughs> then all this attention goes right to Ella. And it dawned on me, oh my God, she's already communicating. I don't need to do anything. I don't need. Ooh, I have chills like all stuff. over my body because yes, yeah. it was unbelievable. And I realized, oh, the way Ella is working is by people looking at her, they have to reframe in their mind. They have to let go of whatever expectations because you can't compete with Ella. She can't walk or talk. You can't right. be better than her. It's like impossible. And you have to try to find a way in your mind to fit her in there. And that naturally helped them break down their barriers. Oh, beautiful. It's an amazing thing. And it was very interesting because we would walk with Ella down the streets and in this church street, which is kind of a marketplace down here in Burlington, Vermont. And people would stare and my wife would get so mad. She, she would get so mad that the people were staring and looking at her. And I was like, oh, I wanted them to stare because I knew if they stare after this experience in the gym, that they're going to have to change their mind around this kid. And That's so powerful. Yeah. I love and that. They fit, fit things into their mind in there every day. They have to let go of a lot of things in order to do that. So, um, so when that happened, I thought my job's done. I, I realized I don't have to like fight or work to get a communication device. I already knew she was communicating. Nice. Um, and in the process of that, I had um, a friend of mine that was, uh, she was also a paraeducator, had introduced me to Michael Tamora, who's my teacher in California, and then Gwyneth uh, Flack and Gail, Dr. Gail Myers. And she said, oh, you really should try this clairvoyant training program. And I thought, I don't know, you know, I was really dragging my feet. I wasn't sure if that's something I would do, but I thought, you know, Dr. Gail Myers had went through medical school. So I thought, oh, if she went through medical school and, and believes there's enough validity to this that she's going to teach it. I'm like, I got to give it a try to see if I can help me. It will help me communicate with Ella more easily and better. And what I ended up realizing is like, oh, I'm already communicating with that. Like I already, <laughs> it just helped me become aware of how I was already doing that. And, That's beautiful. Um, and it, it became more about my own spiritual growth and, and um, stepping into my own awareness and clearing all the limits and blocks uh, or trying to clear the limits and blocks within me and less about that you know, what I intended, intended it to be in the beginning. I love so, that. Yeah. So it was really very interesting. I haven't, haven't gone back since. So I've been studying clairvoyant development with Gwyneth and Gail. I did their clairvoyant training program and a bunch of their programs. And, um, and then I've been studying an advanced program with Michael Tamora um, to continue to, to learn how to be a clairvoyant reader and healing. Mm. Continue to develop I love that. Now I have a quick question because you said, um, uh... So Ella, did she go to a, a regular normal school with, with yeah, like? Here in Vermont, the population is so small that they don't have special schools for kids. Okay. So you, everyone has to find a way to include a child like Ella. I um, love that. So yeah. In, but in Baltimore, it's very different. You know, it's much bigger and they have, they have special schools, which I'm sure Ella would have gone to. And I don't think that would have been helpful for her. Um, I, I, I would agree. I would agree because, um, the interaction is so different, you know, and um, I'm so glad, I mean, and you know, there's no coincidence, everything happens for a reason. And I, I, I firmly believe, you know, she went, she went exactly where she needed to go, not just for her and for you and, and your wife, but also for the, all of the other 400 kids, you know, Absolutely. and the teachers yeah. and everybody that was there at the school. Yep. She changed so many lives. It, it was, I mean, really, it, it's a miraculous very miraculous. <laughs> Her life was miraculous in so many ways. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah. And in, in terms of like that, you know, uh, having a separate school, you know, a lot of the special education whole um, push is to have inclusion so that 
everyone, it's diversity, right? Especially, you know, kids with children with dis disabilities and adults with disabilities and people with disabilities is another form of diversity that makes the world right. go round, you know? Like <laughs> Ella, in a sense, was providing a lot of jobs for people, speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, doctors, nurses, all kinds of people that because of Ella and what she was doing, other people got to fulfill their purpose and share their light mm -hmm. in their way, you know? So, the, um, but, you know, children with disabilities and kids and families and people with disabilities tend to feel isolated, you know, because they can't physically lots of times or even right. be able to interact. So but, well, it's not just that, but I don't fit the norm. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, a yeah. norm thing. And that's which, the thing in it, right? I and, think it's well, like, <laughs> stop limiting people, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. embrace the individuality, embrace the fact that they're different. Right. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if we're all the same, it's like there's this the song it's called Little Boxes. <laughs> and it's like little boxes on the hillside made of ticky tacky. You know, and it's all the same. I mean, the houses are all the same. The people are all the same. They have the same jobs and the kids are not the same. And da da da. how boring is that? Right. It would be very boring. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So I, I always say it's like I look at people and, and I, I don't see for me anyway. I don't see the, the, the physical shell mm -hmm. of a person. I mean, yeah, of course I see it. Don't get me wrong. I totally see it. But the soul and the energy of a person speaks to me way more than their outer shell. Absolutely. You know, and it's like, and when I, when I first read your story with Ella, okay, I was sobbing. Okay, I'm built in the water. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. <laughs> I was so, and it touched me. I've, I mean, I've, I've known you because you've done readings from me, you know, but I have not known you on like a, on a deeper level, like we are talking right now, mm -hmm. yep. you know, and then to read the story. Oh man. Yeah. It just, it just grabbed me. It is so beautiful. And I felt her gift. Mm -hmm. Her gift still keeps on giving, even though she's no longer with us, but mm -hmm. because she was here. And that was, I believe that was her purpose. Absolutely. You know, it's like, not just while she was, she was living, but even beyond now. Yeah. You know, her purpose is to continue to give hope to people and to let people know it's like, Hey, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be different. It's okay to not be able to do X, Y, and Z. And it's okay not to fit the norm. And it's okay. Absolutely. And I so love that. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, the people that Ella affected their lives, they will never forget her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And so, I mean, we get, my wife and I get messages all the time about things that people remembered about her, you know, because she was very, very memorable. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm your host, Beanie Man and Mother Service Dog, who is still sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and our awesome guest, Dave Clark. And we talk about his daughter, Ella, and the life she touched, and, including mine. And I, I did not have the pleasure to meet her in person. But like I said before the break, just reading the story, when Dave sent me the story, I really, I was sobbing. I was sitting here sobbing. And I just sent her a thank you. For, for being here and for sharing her gift with so many and touched so many lives while she was alive and even beyond. So, ah, oh, so beautiful. So let's go back to when you walked into the assembly and, and it's like, oh, my job here is done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that you, your job here is done or was it more kind of like Ella? Well, it- or both. It, yeah, or both, you know, because I realized then, oh, I don't have to work on getting, helping her communicate. I, she's already doing it. I don't, I don't need to like find a way and spend all this energy and time. But also um, within, at, at that time, I didn't know it, of course, but within a year or so after that, about a year and a half, uh, Ella would no longer be with us. Oh, wow. So it was almost as if, you know, the, and when I looked back on it at that time, 
I realized, oh, the lessons had been learned. The, the, the purpose that both Ella, myself and my wife and, and everybody that was involved was complete. We, we had reached, and for me, it was this aspect of really and truly understanding what nonverbal communication or spirit to spirit communication is about, which is really what a clairvoyant reading is, is spirit to spirit. You're communicating from one spirit to the other. You and it's weird, there. guys. <laughs> I tell you, I mean, it's awesome, but. Yeah, it's strange because you can't <laughs> do it body to body. Bodies can't do it. It has to be spirit to spirit. And the only way it works is if you're one, one whole spirit. You, right. won't, you won't work if we're actually truly separate. So um, so that, I think, once I once that dawned on me, I had that like experiential realization that, oh, this is the way Ella's communicating. Ah, it was our, our purpose together was complete. So Ella, like I had said earlier, Ella had been healthy almost all her life. She had one bout of um, pneumonia when she was five. Mm. But for the most part, physically, she was healthy, although she was very skin, skinny. She didn't eat a lot. It was hard. We had to feed her. We fed her manually. So we ended up getting her off the NG tube and we're able to uh, feed her. But we did have to feed her four times a day and change her diaper four times a day. And I was, you know, I'm, I was uh, stronger. So I was the one kind of carrying her around and getting her involved on the physical level everywhere. Um, but, but a year before she died, she got really sick oh, and gosh. she ended up with, um, at the time she wasn't producing red blood cells or platelets. So, but they kept saying they didn't, they couldn't identify. So it wasn't leukemia. It wasn't, uh, really identifiable. This is what's going on. It was oh. more, they kept saying a, a viral suppression of her immune system. And, um, and she was very sick. We spent, um, like 40 or so days in the hospital. They couldn't figure out what was going on. She had to get blood transfusions regularly. Um, or, or I'm sorry, she didn't get blood transfusions regularly. Then what ended up fixing everything is they finally gave her a blood transfusion and everything all of a sudden just reset. And she started huh. producing platelets and they kept thinking it was something more along with her electrolytes and her fluid kind of movement. But mm -hmm. so, so she ended up getting better, although she was very sick and very skinny and um, she didn't really get better. Ella never slept her whole life. <laughs> she was a non-sleeper, man. I, I swear it was my wife and I early on were like, okay, whatever said, because my wife is kind of like a, a drunken sailor in the evenings. If she doesn't get sleep, she'll like cross and yell. And, ah. oh. and so we made a pact really early on. Whatever said between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., we just let it go and we move on. That's, it, that's it, a good rule. I like that. Yeah. And I think more people should implement it. It's like, hey, you know what? If you know your significant other or yourself, Yep. you know, goes off the deep end during a certain time or, but not getting the food or whatever it is, right, you know, right. it's like, put that disclaimer out there. It's like, Hey, between this and this time, <laughs> it's all, it, we just let it go. And we were really let it go. Don't that, dwell actually. on it. We should, we shouldn't dwell on it anyway, but that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we, we were actually, we, we, we stuck to that and it really helped. We just like, would let it go. Cause Ella would be up all night yelling. So it wasn't something like, and the other thing too, is if she was crying enough, she'd eventually vomit. And she couldn't move herself. So we were afraid oh, wow. she would choke on it. And so, so someone had to be up with her until she would fall asleep, but she just wouldn't. And I mean, one time, one time she went 72 hours without sleeping straight. And then she would conk out. But even then it would only be for a couple of hours. You know? Oh, wow. And it would, it would really trick her. Her best time to sleep was like 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. That was when she could finally like get some sleep and then she'd be up again. Wow. You know, so, um, but after she got sick, she pretty much slept that whole year and that we knew something was wrong because that was mm. unusual for Ella. That just wasn't her happy, bright spirit and shiny. So we knew something was up, but you know, she went to a little bit of school that year not a lot. I wasn't taking her because I was doing my student teaching um, for my early child special education license. And, um, and then uh, one day it, we, she, she was just, or one, oh, sorry, one day she had swelling in her feet again. And so mm -hmm. we took her to the doctor and like, take her to the hospital. And so we took her to the hospital. And again, she wasn't producing platelets or red blood cells. And she had edema in her feet, which is what kind of the doctor's like, no, you got to go. And at the same time, they did an x-ray and she had pneumonia too, which was surprising because we didn't think that she had had pneumonia, um, even though we had taken her into the doctors and had them check. And it, it, her, her lungs were kind of, junk, they call them junky already. That was just like a normal thing. Um, so so we realized, oh, okay, she has she has this uh, blood disorder again. Oh, and on my mind, I think, oh, we're just going to do a, a transfusion. She's going to be fine. So we can do the transfusion. Because that's what worked in the past. That's what worked in the past. So I'm thinking, right. okay, great, no problem. We can do this. You know, and it becomes so normal. That's the thing. Like, none of this 
at the time seemed out of the ordinary. It was just, this is what we do. This is what's happening. You take, you know, you, this is what you do. It just becomes your mm-hmm. new norm. And um, so then we, and when the way the platelets last about, um, I forget if it's a red blood cells or the platelets, they last seven days. So you got to go back every seven days to get a check to see if it's going to hold, okay. if it's going to produce. So we go back and it's down again. So she has to get another transfusion. So she gets another transfusion. We go back home and we do this for about five weeks wow. where we're going in weekly and it's, it's not resetting. So, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, fine. We'll just keep doing the blood transfusions and I'm not too worried. But then one, it was a Thursday and I'm thinking, man, Ella's really kind of tired. And typically she'd get tired before a transfusion. Like if she had a transfusion the next day. It was like, she, you know, and I'm thinking, so I'm feeding her. And, um, and she's, she's kind of lethargic, acting kind of funny. And by, by dinner time, it's like, I had to bounce her to keep her awake just to eat. And I thought, man, something's really wrong. Wow. And so, but the next day we had this transfusion. So I'm like, okay, we'll just, we'll go in and see. She slept and didn't wake up. We go into the transfusion. All of her stats are like off the, everything's low. Her oxygen's low, her blood pressure's low. The doctors were so panicky. They like stepped out of the room. I thought, oh my goodness. I even said out loud, my wife will, it, um, it can verify. So I'm like, okay, everyone needs to take a deep breath. <laughs> they were like, really? I mean, it was not adding any type of calm to this situation. They were at so much stress. And uh, so anyway, Ella was really sick and, um, and we got admitted <clears throat> to the hospital. And um, we had met with a pound of care doctor when she was five and healthy just to hash out a plan. Okay, what are we gonna do in the event that something happens so right. that everyone would already be prepared? We don't have to think about it in the moment and make these hard decisions. And it's, and it's good It's a good. It's good advice to have that mm-hmm. plan, you know? Um, I mean, even for normal circumstances, it is Absolutely. good to have that plan in case of because tomorrow is never promised. Absolutely. For any of us. Mm-hmm. So. And it makes the decision-making process so much easier because it's already written, it's, it's just there. Right, and, because you did it when you had your clear mind yep. and not when you're in panic mode. Because when That's we're right. in panic mode and survival mode, it logic goes out the window. Yeah, which it just really doesn't got, exist. It doesn't. And when we first, when Ella first got sick, we had thought we had, and our pediatrician forgot to write the plan down. So the uh, first time Ella got sick, we had to, I had to go through it all with them again. And the palliative care doctor at the time was on sabbatical. So it was, totally <laughs> it was like, it was like a, a comedy of errors. But, um, but the second time, everything was written down, and we had chosen a path of middle of the road care. So we weren't going to pull the kid, we weren't going to just pull care away, but we also weren't going to throw the kitchen sink at her either. So, right. which meant, you know, intensive care, bone marrow transplants, lots and lots of different things. And she had pneumonia the whole time. Mm. So they weren't going to do anything with the pneumonia anyway, because it was, it was getting worse. So she had gone through a treatment of antibiotics and had to go at it, had to have another stronger treatment because it wasn't getting better. And so, so we go in and I thought, okay, she's going to wake up every time she got her needle prick to get the blood, she'd wake up, but she didn't. I thought, man, something's really wrong. So we get admitted. She still doesn't wake up. And, um, the palliative care doctor comes in and says, um, you know, you're doing middle of the road care. The next is intensive care. And that was such a shock to me. I couldn't, it didn't wow. even, it didn't even like occur to me that I was doing middle of the road care had no idea. I, to me, like I said before, it was just normal. This is just what I'm doing. It's every day. It's just what we do. Mm-hmm. And here that it was middle of the road, I knew immediately we got, we're taking her home. And that was just such a shock. And I, and it was, um, um, but we had it all set we, that we, that decision was so easy though, because it had already been planned. So once we knew it was going to this level, we knew what we were going to do. And it doesn't make it easy, <laughs> right? No, I was just going to say, I mean, it helps, yeah. but it does not make it easier by any no, means. It is really tough, especially the walk out of the hospital. It, it, it looked like ants to me, all these little mm-hmm. ants. And like, nobody knows what's happening. Like I'm walking my daughter home to care for her home so she can die. And no, everyone's walking around. Like it was so surreal. And I could I just, it was so um, just unbelievable. I, I couldn't even believe it. I thought, I, I can't believe I'm walking my daughter out to go home to die. I just, wow. it did so, you feel like you wanted to scream at people and to let them know? I, you know, for me, I was more in just total disbelief. I just couldn't believe it. I, I just couldn't believe that no one knew it was because I, and at that time, when I look back, I, I kind of saw everything as a whole. Mm-hmm. It was very strange. It was like ants, like a whole kind of people moving like a thing. And I thought, wow, how do they not know? <laughs> <laughs> But they didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't know. And, and then we get home, you know, and it's tricky because, um, 
we had to do all the paperwork. And that's, that's a whole nother story. But um, you end up getting home and we thought, okay, caring for at home is going to be the best place. So we're not, we're not feeding her the powder. The hospice people came and, and I decided that I was going to administer the medications because you need you know, morphine. And then they give you medications to dry up the lungs so that they, they call it the death rattle doesn't uh, can be hard to, to deal with if you're caring for someone through the transition process. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I, I remember like opening the door, I realized, oh my God, I don't have to feed her anymore. Thinking like, oh my God, I don't have to change her diaper anymore. So that was a process of uh, my identity starting to devolve. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I had put a lot of my energy and my identity in being Ella's dad and care and a caretaker. And I wasn't aware of that at the time. So all that was starting mm-hmm. to kind of unravel. And, and I would uh, say that's fairly common because you're so focused on taking care of your loved one, you yeah. know, that takes like over everything, yep. um, you know, you just put your whole everything into it and it becomes your identity. I totally get that. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's so easy. It's that to the point where, when it went away, I didn't, I didn't even, it was like, now well, what? Yeah. Like, what like, do I do? I who am I? I have no idea what to do. It's like, <laughs> it's really crazy. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but, um, so what we had decided to do is open up our house. So we decided to invite anybody who wanted to come to say goodbye or to help out in the process of her transitioning to come. And I had just finished the Clairvoyant training program, which was a two-year program. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't had a lot of training yet. And I wasn't, I was able to do some reason, but I wasn't giving any professional readings. I was just kind of doing it for my own spiritual growth. And um, so over the, over the span of a four-day period, um, Ella only woke up two times. Um, one time we had to change her and then another time uh, later on closer to the day that she passed. Um, but, you know, through that period, my mom and myself and my wife and, and so her family, her sister came up, my mom came up and my wife's mom came up and they had a really good friend from high school who lives in town that came. But we had over at any given time, we had like 25 people wow, coming in and helping out and bringing food and sharing stories and just really supportive in a sense that we didn't have to do everything ourselves because I remember at first thinking oh my god we can't invite anyone up like I can't take because I was so used to like taking care of them and making sure that my mom and family was happy and that but but we ended up switching that I'm really glad we did I'm really glad we invited everyone in because it helped a ton gave more breaks so that we didn't have to do all the work ourselves oh absolutely so you know it it was uh, uh, over a three-day period and that the last day was Mother's Day of all days, um, it was Mother's Day. And we had some really funny experiences like the day before Ella died, Julie saw a rabbit outside. And, and then the day after Ella died, she saw two rabbits. Huh. And then for like three weeks, I had a rabbit in front of the car in the middle of the street while I was driving and rabbits are skittish. And I was honking at it to try to get food and it wouldn't <laughs> Like, move. yo, I have a message for you, listen. I had to get out of the car and shush the rabbit off the road. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my God, if that's not a message, I don't know what is. Uh, it was really kind of funny. But um, so the, at the, towards the end, it was, I was holding my daughter and my wife was next to me holding her feet. We had my, my mom, my, uh, my wife's sister, my friend, Matt Sadowski from high school and Julie's mom. My, my, we had seven people. And then my wife goes, she goes, she's gone. And I turned and looked and she was gone. And then the, the thing that happened next was just so we'll have chills. <laughs> the, the veil, literally the veil went right down. I saw Ella get out of her body and walk. And I saw three light beings greeting her on the other side. Oh, and it wow. was <laughs> so still, but mm. celebratory. It was like a total graduation, but it was timeless still and euphoric, like bliss. And I, I, I was totally, I just couldn't believe I was like stunned in this complete, state of like ecstasy <laughs> like it might right? I mean it's, it's such a contrast of dichotomies right you wouldn't think that holding your daughter and holding her while she's dying is going to create a, a moment of complete and total ecstasy and oneness with God mm. or, or the all whatever you want to use the term doesn't really matter it's just to describe it is so hard because it is timeless and still yet there's celebration mm. and it, it's an unbelievable experience and I and then all of a sudden, I'm, it, the veil drops and I'm back sitting in my chair and I'm like crying and we're all hugging. I'm like, we're doing a great, we did a great job. Because what I saw was like, she's in a great place. I thought, oh my God. I, I, and I had been spiritual my whole life, but that experience, I'm like, there is no doubt we are spirit. I, I have absolutely no doubt having had that experience that we are spiritual beings. 
No, that's so beautiful. Oh my gosh, I have chill. I cannot. I'm sitting here and I have chills. Like, and I get it. Mm -hmm. it wow, just it's wow. I mean, that is like happiness amplified to an nth degree. You know, it's literally you can't. The words don't describe it because it, mm -hmm. you're like one with spirit. It's I don't even know how to describe it. It's bliss or ecstasy or something. Right. That is how you. So, um. Because you had the training for two years at that point. Um, I, I mean, I know and I believe that because you did that, mm -hmm. you know, that really helped you see what you saw when she transitioned. Absolutely. And I it's can, I mean, I can feel the, I mean, I can feel the sadness, but at the same time, I can feel the joy and the comfort and, and the knowing that it's okay. Absolutely. And it, you know, I was the only one that had that experience with it, that where I saw the veil come down, my wife didn't see that and no one else did. And, and I, I just saw it as a process of no effort at all. It was amazing. And my, I remember afterwards, my mother-in-law saying, oh, Ella was a fighter. And I'm like, that's not what happened. She, mm -hmm. the reason it was so beautiful is because she let go. She didn't resist the process. And we had a lot of support there too, helping her. Right. You know, but after, you know, that experience happened. So you don't, that experience can, you'll never forget an experience like that. No, it's just, I cannot. <laughs> that doesn't go away. But it also doesn't cover over the pain that happens after that, right. where I had to carry her to the hearst. Mm. I wanted to do that. And um, I mean, I had an absolute schism. I, I don't even remember what happened. I remember walking out of the door thinking, oh my God, are, are the neighbors watching? And not not for any batteries, but I'm like, can, it, again, it was like the hospital. Like this is unbelievable. I'm carrying my daughter's body to a hearse. It just it, like mm. the thought of that and the experience of having to do that. And I had this kind of schism where I just like I think I went right out of the body and and then came back in. I was just crying. I thought I was utterly alone. I thought I'd walk my daughter out, put her into the thing, completely alone. And I, a couple of days later, I was telling that. So I, my wife was like, No, I was right there next to you. But because of that schism, I, I had no recollection of it. I thought I was utterly alone, doing it completely by myself. And, and so, you know, that part, you know, just and I had that really blissful experience. But then the, the kind of denser ego body aspects of myself, you know, that were tied into my identity as a dad and my voice. That we all struggle with. Oh, yeah. It's like, <laughs> God, it came roaring back. And it took me about four and a half years to really think about being social again in any type of, and I was still doing all the clairvoyant training. I was still studying. I was transmuting energy, blowing pictures, all kinds of stuff, but it's just really difficult. And as anyone who's had lost a child or even lost anyone you really love, it is not easy. Right. And um, so, you know, part of the, but, but when you get through that, at least for me, my experience, when I got through all that, it's like, oh my God, this is what I've been meant to do. You know, cause I've always thought after Ella died, I'm like, God, what am I going to do with my life? Just like you had said, like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I, I know, right? It's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Ella made my life purpose easy. Here you go. You know, this is what it is. It was so easy. Every day was just so simple because I knew exactly what I needed to do. And so what oh, I realized wow. is I was more afraid of living than dying. Because oh, wow. with Ella, I had my purpose and now I had to create my own purpose. I had to mm -hmm. like fulfill another aspect of myself that wasn't just so tied up into that identity with Ella. And then I started to really grow and expand out of that and become the clairvoyant that I am now. So yeah. um, that, that whole process helped me uh, be able to see the larger context of Ella's life and her death. And, and now I can get to help people become more aware of themselves as spirit and deconstruct the divisions and things in their mind that divide them and make them feel separate. So I love that. Guys, I'm going to take another quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Thanks for hanging around. I'm your host, Beanie Man, and more the service talk. And yes, he is still sleeping, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and my wonderful guest, Dave Clark. And we were talking about his daughter, Ella. And let's talk about the their clairvoyant piece now. Mm -hmm. That that you fully stepped into embraced. And you know, and I totally understand when you said that after she was gone, I was like, who am I? What do mm -hmm. I do? My whole purpose is 
I mean, or the, the, the feeling of your purpose, you know, what you thought was your purpose was gone. Absolutely. Um, like now what? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah. You know, I know so many of our viewers can relate to that because at some point, big or small, I think we've all been there, Mm -hmm. you know, when we totally had to reinvent ourselves. And I was like, well, that did not work away. This is no longer there. Now, what do I do? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, and for you, having done the, the, the two years of the training, um, Tell us, tell us that then after, you know, Ella passed away and how did you get your sense of purpose back? Yeah, well, the first thing, you know, afterwards I had, um, uh, first thing we did, my wife and I traveled across the country for two months. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and, and we celebrated her life. <laughs> I love that. And, uh, and conceived my son. Who, um, <laughs> I love in, that. <laughs> in Hawaii, <laughs> we think. So that was part of it. But I had I just finished my master's in early child special ed too. So the first step for me was I was still doing my clairvoyant training, but really the, the part of that training and taking the classes and continuing was to help me clear all the pain and, and the grief mm-hmm. and the loss and the suffering. And in the process of doing that, it helped me, you know, clairvoyance is just your ability to see clearly. That's all it really means. And see the truth from the life, see beyond what we perceive it to be. Right. And so that whole process helped me clear enough of the energy so I could see the context of Ella's life and death instead of being stuck in the grief and the suffering and not being able to even move on because it's that's so powerful. powerful. Yeah. So clearing, helping, continuing to, you know, Ella's birth got me on track and Ella's death helped me start on my purpose. And it really is the beginning to look within for your answers. And so mm-hmm. And clearing, when you know, being the minute you start to look within, you start finding all the pictures and programming and limits and, and all the stuff that you've been believing to be true. And you clear that, and then your light starts getting brighter and brighter and brighter, and you become wholer and wholer and wholer. And then your, your vision on a clairvoyant level, as well as your intuition on a crown level, and your ability to communicate and express through your fist chakra, all that starts to open because you're clearing from all different arenas. And you become more and more whole, brighter and brighter, it gets clearer and clearer. But it, it wasn't at a point, I was still wasn't at a point where I could give professional readings or anything like that. So I started right into working with kids with disabilities. I started in a preschool program. I, I'm a birth, certified birth to six teacher, uh, early childhood special education. And nice. so I was helping kids with and their families with disabilities at a public school setting, but didn't really resonate. As a matter of fact, it, it didn't go well at all. Uh, I started the Ella died Mother's Day in May and I started in September and I, uh, that's too early. <laughs> in retrospect, that was too early. <laughs> I should not have gone back into that kind of uh, setting at that at, was still in so much pain. Um, but it, I learned, you know, it's, I, you can do that kind of learning in much more grace, though. You don't have to put yourself in the fire like that, uh, right. like I did. So I ended up leaving that job mid, mid-year and going and working for a birth to three organization, which is a nonprofit organization helping families and kids with disabilities. So it's identifying children with delays and disabilities, then doing their evaluations and then providing the services, you know, speech and language and um, physical therapy. And I was a developmental educator. So I worked on all kinds of development, but mainly uh, social, emotional development and cognitive development. And um, we call it um, uh, uh, language development, early, early language development. So, so I was doing that. And in that process, I built, I was also starting to give readings. So I wasn't, um, really quote professional yet. And, but the whole time I'm taking classes and continuing my development and that six chakra and ability to see is opening up more and more. And um, to the point where, when we lost the funding and, and all along, it's very interesting. Cause once I started doing the clairvoyant training program, the very first day I'm like, I'm going to, I knew, I don't know why I knew I was going to give clairvoyant readings professionally. I, I knew it. I right away. I knew this is what I'm going to do. Cause you just, I, I mean, when, when you are following your purpose, and you're moving into the direction of that doesn't ma- doesn't mean you have to know what it looks like and what it all entails and everything, but you yep. just have that inner knowing. It's like this is what I'm gonna do. That's, I don't that's, know how. I don't know. Yeah. I know nothing, but this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and it wasn't. It's like it wasn't. A, it, it it wasn't. It was expensive, but the money always showed up. It was just unbelievable. Funny how and that works. It is. It's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't start, you know, um, from starting the clairvoyant training program. And even after Ella died, I didn't start giving professional readings for another seven years. So oh, wow. that whole development of my clairvoyant ability 
right now is my beginning of my 12th year of studying. So I started giving professional, like full-time readings a year and a half ago. So it's almost 10 years of development of taking classes. Also, like, so I got to you right when you like started. Yeah, or full-time. I had been doing this bridging thing where I was half-time at the early childhood special ed and oh, half-time gotcha. giving clairvoyant readings. So I had, um, I wasn't doing it full-time though. And it's, this is another thing that Spirit does is like, okay, our, the nonprofit that had the funding for the providing the early childhood special education services lost the contract. And the contract went to another organization that I could have worked for, but they were only offering full-time jobs. And I'm like, I've put way too much time and energy mm -hmm. in this, developing this clairvoyant. Well, that was the nudge from the universe kicking you in the butt. That's right. That's and so how that's that works. Great thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been great. It's, uh, so now I've been doing it full-time for a year and a half, but I've been giving professional readings for about four and a half years. I love uh, that. Total. I but love still, that. From the beginning to even that was like six years, seven years of training. Hey. Uh, to get to that point. But I love that. That's where I think happiness lies, is within the identification of yourself as the soul you are in your body. It's you get to express oh, you light that. through your body and the soul, as long as you're not divided with your pictures and your ego, naturally it contains happiness. It's, it's innate to all of us, the joy. As a matter of fact, it it's is. way more than happiness. It's like ecstasy, like that experience I had with Ella's death. It's right. way bigger than that, you know? It is. I think this is like the found basic beginning stage of what spirit levels can be. Thank so, you. I yeah. agree. And since you mentioned happiness, I mean, the show is called Happiness Matters. <laughs> you know, funny how that works. <laughs> so my question to you is, and I asked all my guests that, it's like, um, how do you define happiness? What does it mean to you? And what do you do to add to your happiness? And no, work does not count. Even if we love it. So, so for me, happiness just means being yourself as the spirit you are and shining that light. Oh, and uh, it doesn't mean that that's going to be easy because the ego wants to come in and, you know, but as you continue to develop the ability to transmute that and find your light and shine it, happiness just shows up. It's just naturally there. So the more you are able to identify with yourself as spirit, the happier you're going to be. The more you're identifying as your ego, the less happier you're going to be. <laughs> basically. You are so my people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really kind of simple, but but it's hard in practice, right? If if it was easy in practice, we'd all be doing it, but it's not. Well, so. you know, it's it's that ego thing, you know, yeah. that needs to get in, and that um, that tape that we keep playing on repeat, you yeah. know, or that that we let play on repeat, that's bringing us down, that's stopping us and Absolutely. pulling us down, and then we have all the doubts and all of that, you know, and then it's like, oh wait a minute, and then. We hear something, maybe it's a song or something somebody says, and it's like, oh yeah, happiness. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, what the, some of the things that I do to help me, I meditate a lot. So that's one thing that helps with a lot of happiness to help clear the parts of me that might be struggling with within my ego. But on a, like basically on an everyday play is what I find the easiest thing. Like I'll play with my son, I'll, I'll not look at life as work or responsibility, but look at it as a, you know, like two, two things like musicians, they don't go to work, they go to play, right? right. They play music. And, but in most areas of life where I was looking at, I got to go to work, you know? <laughs> so, so treating life as a, a form of play has been really helpful and bringing in lots of like amusement, neutrality, and compassion. The three, Ooh, like, I love that. can you repeat two. that a little slower? Yeah, sure. Amusement, compassion, and neutrality. Oh, I consider the, yeah. like the three, and my, my teacher, Michael Tamora is the one that teaches that. He really teaches that very, very well. But those are like the cornerstones to, to happiness. If you have compassion, you have your neutrality and your amusement, you're, you're going to be, you're golden, you know? And so anytime you start, that starts waning, then you have to, okay, I'm not being myself, right? Because right. I'm not in amusement. I'm not being compassionate. I'm not being neutral. Then, and neutrality is not, complacency it's action from a state of inner peace or enthusiasm and joy that's the way i define it so it's not inaction like lots of times we um or, or, uh, as we grow up we think that's what neutrality means but right. it's it's actually action from a state of inner peace you know mm. um like so that. those are those are the the real ways in in you know identifying with myself as spirit and catching myself <laughs> that's ego the body. tricky part the catching it yourself <laughs> it's really tricky it's like the un you know most of the pictures of the ego we're unconscious to that's why we end up becoming the ego because we're not aware that oh now we're in this energy of this program of this limit we're just we think it's our identity our norm like it was with me being a, my daughter's dad you know mm -hmm. 
just became my identity, but that's right. a really limiting identity to the totality of spirit, right? It's, I agree. It's very See, I call it autopilot. We go mm -hmm. on autopilot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I call it. You I know, like and it's like, and we do the same thing over and over and over and over, you know, and a lot of times it's like, for me, it wasn't for a long time. It's gotten more miserable, more miserable, more miserable until you get the wake up call. So, yeah. but hey, ha to me, happiness is a choice too. Absolutely. I, you, know, I, you choose I, it every day and, and it's like, you go from there, but I love, I love that. I love yeah. That. So the, Thank you know, you. the meditation, like the grounding and gold sun are two forms of practice that really help because the grounding can help transmute energy out that you don't want to experience. And then the gold sun is the visualization of where you would like to be. Mm. So what kind of energy would you like to have and see it as a gold sun and bring it in and fill yourself with it? The happy kind. Yeah, the happy guy. <laughs> because rainbow is a color and unicorns are real in my That's world right. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's so good. <laughs> oh, if, hey, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, the best way is to visit. You can visit my website at www.divineroots.love. Uh, or you can email me at Dave Clark 10 my name, D-A-V-E-C-L-A-R-K-1-0 at verizon.net and all that information will be on the website too so it, you know if there's if you're interested in learning more about what i do with the classes i teach or readings that'll all be on the website and you can schedule directly through there um, or look up the class so that the website is probably the easiest way but you can also email me and uh, nice. my phone number is on the website too so i mean I can, perfect so you can contact me text awesome. or call. yeah thank you so much oh, thank for sharing you so much. ella with us for sharing your story, for sharing your heart, and for all that you do. Absolutely. Thank so, you so much. Appreciate you. Appreciate you too.